And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, welcome to Thursday. Um, as we're discussing it in these videos, Thursday of uh, the most important week in the history of the world. And uh, that reading from Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16, um, underlines how Thursday is sort of a preparation day. It was a preparation day for people celebrating Passover, but it also it's really a preparation day for the disciples. Jesus is preparing them for what's about to happen on Friday and really um, for the rest of their lives. Thursday is a very important day. We have quite a bit of scripture devoted to that day. Uh, in all four Gospels, um, all three of the synoptics, that is the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, tell an account of what we just read, Jesus securing place for them to eat the Passover meal together on Thursday evening. Um, but also we have... Um, on, on Thursday, the actual eating of the meal together, and, um, and then later on, them leaving the upper room and going to the garden, um, going out of the city, going to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will go uh, with three of the disciples for a time of prayer. Again, preparing them if they would have just cooperated and preparing himself for what is about to happen on Friday. Uh, one other thing to mention, just sort of an overview, there's a long section in the Gospel of John. Basically, John chapters 13 through 17 are all devoted to things that Jesus did and said on Thursday night in the upper room. Very important passages, you know, where Jesus says, Things like, I am the light of the world, and he talks about the Holy Spirit, and he prays a great prayer on behalf of the disciples. Sometimes it's called the high priestly prayer. And um, he makes this statement, a new commandment I give you, um, that you should love one another, and washes the disciples' feet, and so forth. Now, you may hear... Uh, today, or you may have heard this week somebody referring to today, Thursday, as Maundy Thursday. Um, those who celebrate Holy Week uh, in a particular religious way um, might refer to today as Maundy Thursday. That always seemed like a strange term to me. Um, Maundy, actually, that word comes from a Latin word, a uh, Latin word that means commandment. And so when Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, in the Latin translation, it was this word, uh, mondatum, which comes down to us as mondi. So mondi Thursday is commandment Thursday. And Jesus gave them a commandment to love one another, and he illustrated that by washing their feet. A lot of people uh, think of Mondi referring to the foot washing in particular, but really it's the new commandment to love one another. Uh, but that's where that term comes from. Uh, but I just thought we would survey again through some of the important events and, and passages that take place on Thursday, like we've been doing this week. Uh, so Passover is sort of the center of it all. You know, Passover was uh, 
a week-long celebration in Jerusalem. It was a, a time where the population of the city swelled greatly. Some say maybe up to a million people came to Jerusalem for Passover. Uh, for the ancient world, that's a gigantic number. Some say that uh, as many as 100,000 lambs would be slaughtered during this festival. It's not that huge of a place if you've ever been to Jerusalem or, or you know about it. So can you imagine the smell in Jerusalem and the rivers of blood and so forth that accompanied uh, this festival? It was, uh, no doubt, a, an amazing spectacle to behold. Well, Jesus instructs the disciples to secure this room, this second story room, we call it the upper room, for the meal that they will celebrate. And of course, uh, this comes to be known as the Last Supper, originally a Passover meal. And one of the great things, again, that Jesus does is um, in John chapter 13, he um, washes the disciples' feet, and to do so, he, he sort of strips off his outer garments and, and takes on the role that a, a servant would have taken on, a slave in the ancient world. Um, he dressed himself like a slave, basically, and did what a slave did, washed, washed people, washed the feet of the disciples. And you have to imagine how this would have convicted the disciples um, because they probably, as he does it, realize we should have done this. In fact, Peter will object uh, to Jesus doing it. And um, it's an interesting back and forth between Jesus and Peter. Um, but they had to realize they were really, they were the servants. They should have been washing Jesus' feet. But he, he tells them, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm giving you an example. I don't think an example that literally uh, from, from that time until 2,000 years later, Jesus' disciples ought to literally be washing one another's feet, uh, but that they ought to be serving each other very humbly in, in humble ways. And that was part of that new commandment to love one another. That Jesus gave them. Um, we, we see Peter here in John 13 as this guy once again full of extremes. You know, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. And then when the Lord rebukes him, he says, okay, wash all of me, head to toe. Um, so we're, we see Peter revealed, and uh, not just him, of course, but Judas also. Um, on this evening is is revealed because Jesus is going to specifically point him out to be the one who is going to betray him. But before he does that, he washes Judas's feet. And um, that's an incredible moment in itself. Um, it, it's just a, a wonderful passage, John chapter 13, 1 through 20, where Jesus performs this act of service and including um, um, blessing even the betrayer. Uh, just a couple of verses there at the end of that. Uh, Jesus says, verse 18, John 13, I'm not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. There he's, he's referring to, uh, to Judas. Jesus knows what's going on in the heart of Judas, what Judas is going to do. And he will, in more than one way, point toward Judas as we look on here. Um, in fact, he's going to identify him. It's interesting, it, it seems like the other disciples... Although Jesus is, Jesus is very specific, very explicit in identifying Judas, it, it appears that they don't pick up on it. Uh, 
there's something going on with the disciples through this time. It's it's like they're they're in a haze, and maybe we we all would be if we were experiencing what they were experiencing. But they're not seeing things clearly all the time. Uh, verse 21, John 13. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, and testified. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of the disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Of course, we know that disciple whom Jesus loved was likely John, the writer of this gospel. Jesus answered him, It's he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So he had dipped the morsel. He gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, What you're going to do, do quickly. Remember, we noticed on Wednesday, um, this idea expressed that, that Satan enters into the heart of Judas to um, hatch this plot of betrayal and to sell Jesus to the authorities basically for 30 pieces of silver. Now again, John mentions as well Satan entering into him. There is a spiritual warfare going on um, beyond the physical but it goes on in uh, verse 28 and says, Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. That's why I'm saying Jesus has just pointed out, it seems, who the betrayer is, but no one seems to catch up and to figure it out. And um, you know, even to demonstrate their confusion more, it says some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should go give something to the, poor, to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. The last phrase in that account, certainly on, ominous, isn't it? It was night. So we know that the, uh, the, the supper is being uh, eaten in the evening, and um, dark things are taking place. And um, Judas is, is at going out to, to do his evil deed. Well, uh, then, then the accounts of the gospel writers move to the actual supper. Uh, these are pretty familiar passages to most believers, uh, most Christians, because when we eat the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, uh, a lot of times we read these texts, don't we, from Matthew chapter 26 or Mark 14 or, or Luke 22. Uh, we'll read the institution or the setting up of the Lord's Supper by Jesus. Uh, Matthew 26 is one of the places, verses 26 through 29. Again, emphasizing it, this was originally a Passover meal. Um, and Jesus is taking the, the emblems of the Passover, which meant one thing to Jews, um, and, and, and sort of transforming them to mean something now to those who are his disciples, his followers. He intends that the unleavened bread of the Passover meal will now represent his body, which he's about to give the very next day. He's, he's to give his body on the cross and so the bread represents his body, and then the cup, uh, which is uh, drunk after the meal, the cup of the wine, um, Jesus uses to represent his blood, which, of course, will be given the next day as well. And, and, and Jesus announces here in Matthew 26 a new covenant. It's a new covenant in his blood. Uh, just passage after passage in these accounts are so important and rich um, that it almost seems wrong to, to pass over them so quickly. 
in an overview like this, but the new covenant uh, that, that the Old Testament prophets spoke of and is coming, and now hundreds of years later, here we have it, the new covenant that Jesus establishes, the new agreement between people and God concerning their relationship, and in particular here, forgiveness of sins, the new covenant in Jesus' blood. I thought I'd just mention, especially for uh, Lancaster Church people, it's, it's interesting, you know, what, what, what would that have looked like? What would the elements have looked like uh, 2,000 years ago? Uh, we can only imagine. And then here we are today, and, and um, while, while we're isolated because of this um, pandemic and so forth, um, some of us are, are partaking of, of communion using these little prepackaged Lord's Supper, Supper element uh, packages, um, which we have at the building and are available to you if you want to use them as you on Sunday take the Lord's Supper. But you see, how, if you haven't seen them before, how, how they're organized. There's a little piece of bread under plastic here. You just pull up the plastic and the wafer is there, the unleavened bread, and then just below it, um, the fruit of the vine. Uh, sort of handy little thing. Nice, all sealed up. You can use those, but it's amazing how times have changed, isn't it? But this is the, the original supper that Jesus institutes and then intends his disciples to to eat often in memory of him. Uh, in addition to, to eating the supper, and a lot of other things are going on, um, Jesus obviously has predicted who's going to betray him, but he also predicts some of the things that the others are going to do. For instance, Peter, uh, John 13, verses 31 through 38, Jesus says, you're going to deny me. Um, Judas has just left to betray Jesus, and um, Jesus refers in that, that passage to his death as being glorified. And, um, and, and here in the same context, he predicts that Peter is going to deny him, deny that he even knows Jesus. And that will happen not many hours from when he spoke it. He goes on, um, he talks about himself as the true vine and the disciples are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches, that famous text. He talks about how they're going to experience all kinds of opposition from the world in chapters 15 and 16 of John. He, you see, he's preparing them for what's to come. And these are going to be things that they're going to have to remind themselves of later because they're, they're sort of just going over their head right now, I think. Uh, but he, he's preparing them, and, and they will remember his word. The, the Holy Spirit will, will bring things to their memory. Uh, in fact, Jesus in chapter 16 of John is specifically going to say, I'm, I'm sending you a helper that's going to be with you in my absence the Holy Spirit, and he will comfort you and counsel you uh, throughout all the coming trials. And so it's a, in many different ways, this is a, a, a day of preparation, um, Thursday of the most important week. And then again, in, in chapter 17 of John, you have the great prayer uh, that, that Jesus prays, uh, we're familiar with the, the brief Lord's Prayer, what, what we call the Lord's Prayer. If I were going to name one of the prayers that Jesus prayed, the Lord's Prayer, it would be this one here in John 17, because it is his great prayer in the Scripture. And he, uh, he speaks to the Father. He speaks to the Father on behalf of the disciples. He asks uh, God to protect them and and to preserve them and so forth. And in fact, he doesn't just pray for them. If you read John 17, 
all the way to the end, he prays for you. If you're a believer today in 2020, April 9th of 2020, sort of shut away in your home, if you're a believer, he prays for you. He says, I don't ask for these only, Jesus says to the Father, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So Jesus prays for all of us on this Thursday evening uh, of the most important week in the history of the world. The next thing, is after they leave the upper room, as I said, they, they make their way out of the city, through the city gates, heading toward um, Bethany, where they've been, we imagine, um, where they've been spending each evening. They go up to Gethsemane, which is a garden on the Mount of Olives. It seems to have been a place where Jesus and the disciples went. Uh, to pray, maybe to, to worship, to share in devotion. All four gospel writers make reference to the time in Gethsemane. Matthew in chapter 26, Mark in chapter 14, Luke in chapter 22, and John in chapter 18. And so Jesus has just uttered a, a long, involved prayer. Uh, while, while in the upper room, he's prayed as he as he gave them the elements of the, the first Lord's Supper. And now he's going to pray in the garden. There's a lot of prayer going on as the end nears. And, um, and, and this uh, moves us closer and closer to uh, the time of his betrayal and that will that will get us that will get us um, into the next day. So we don't know exactly uh, when the clock flipped midnight. Although that's in one sense it's not really relevant for the for the scriptural story because remember the way they reckoned time, uh, the new day started at 6 p.m. So in a sense. Uh, once six hit, it was the next day. For them, they're already into Friday. For us, we think of, well, it's not Friday until until midnight. Uh, but some sometime late in the evening, they go toward Gethsemane, and um, Jesus with, uh, with Peter, James, and John goes into the garden, asks them to watch and pray, and he goes before the Father with this very intense prayer. Sometime in there is probably when uh, Friday begins, uh, and and eventually Judas shows up, and I think by the time that happens, we're likely into the wee hours in the morning, uh, or at least into Friday, what we would call Friday, which we'll look at in the next video um, concerning the events of. Of Friday, a lot of people call Good Friday, uh, which, of course, so much of the gospel accounts are devoted to. So Thursday, sort of an emphasis on preparation in many different ways, in preparing for the events of the next day. And I hope you'll be able to tune back in uh, tomorrow to review the events of that most important day, which everything has been building to the day on which our Savior went to the cross for us. Have a great evening. God bless you. See you soon.